Take two. Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I started this YouTube channel to help my own MS clinic patients learn between visits. And it's my hope that through these videos and through these live streams, I can help you learn too. This is my second attempt on a very rainy Thursday in Columbus, Ohio to jump online. I tried a little bit earlier this morning and it was buffering and it just wasn't working well. So I can't stop the rain outside. I can't stop the inclement weather, but I have moved my computer directly next to the router. I can't get any closer to the router uh, humanly possible. So let's try it one more time, jumping back online, looking forward to amassing this global growing online village, this MS community. When we get together so that we can talk, I can answer your questions live and I can talk about this brand new FDA approved medicine called Vumerity or diroximal fumarate. We're going to talk a little bit about that. I'm going to share with you my opinions and my impressions. Elizabeth Hayes says, thanks for trying again. Elizabeth, thank you for trying again with me. A couple shout outs to some nice people that have jumped online. Melissa's calling in from Maine. What's up, Melissa? Susan B is back online from Ohio. Hello. Sandy is here. She says it sounds better and that makes me super happy. I've got Patty who's online. I've got even so it is well who's all back. Matt Z is up in the house. Matt is one of our amazing moderators. Matt, as always, thank you very, very much. Now, as we jump online, please make sure to include where you're calling in from. I absolutely love meeting folks from this global growing online community. Also, as you share questions, please keep in mind that I can't diagnose you. I can't treat you through the interwebs on this live stream. So you can't send me a quick couple questions about you specifically and me give you a meaningful answer. Make sure the questions are general enough that everyone on the live stream, everyone in the chat can benefit. Um, if I don't reach your question during the course of the live stream, do not fret. As many of you who follow my channel know, I go back through all of the questions. I copy and paste them into a giant folder that I keep on my computer. And when I have some downtime, I make videos specifically about questions that haven't been answered. I like to group them based on topic. In fact, this morning I published a video entitled MS Hertz. I'm going to include a link uh, in the uh, chat box right now. This is a video that I published this morning uh, where I answered archived viewers' questions on various aspects of multiple sclerosis pain. So if you haven't checked out that video, click the link in uh, the chat, take a look at it, and let me know your thoughts upon it. Um, I would love to get your feedback and your comments. Just leave those in the section down below. Now, I wanted to accomplish two things when I was on the live stream today. The first one is I wanted to talk uh, a little bit about uh, this newly approved uh, medicine by the FDA, diroximal fumarate. The trade name is uh, Vumerity. I, I didn't make up the name. <laughs> and I also wanted to answer your questions live. So let's start by discussing uh, this newly approved medicine. This newly approved medicine is what I call a Me Too medicine. It's a medicine that is very similar to something that's already on the market with a slight tweak. So this story doesn't start in 2019, October. It actually starts in 2013 when dimethylfumarate, dimethylfumarate, which is codenamed for Tecfidera, was first approved by the American FDA to treat relapsing forms of MS. Now, Tecfidera is a pill that you take twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. And Tecfidera is a pill that has been shown in relapsing MS to decrease frequency of MS attacks, to decrease new spots on the MRI, to decrease disability progression, and to even improve quality of life in MS, which is good stuff. And in the clinical trials, it looked like it was very safe and it looked like it was very effective. And we were very, very excited about it. I participated in the clinical trials for dimethyl fumarate for Tecfidera. And when it hit the market, my clinic was gangbusters excited about it. And we put a lot of newly diagnosed people and we put a lot of people that had breakthrough disease on dimethyl fumarate, Tecfidera. Again, I'm talking about circa 2013 era. Now, moving forward in time, we learned in the real world, Tecfidera didn't seem to work out as well as it did in the initial clinical trials. Why not? Uh, we've actually studied this. We've published some papers on this. It looks like there's two big factors. Factor number one in why Tecfidera didn't work as well 
outside of clinical trials as it did in clinical trials is, is because number one, people in the real world are a bit older in chronologic age than they were in the trials. And we think that when you apply Tecfidera in a slightly older population compared to those studied in the clinical trials, it didn't work as well. More importantly, maybe, or also very important, is the fact that Tecfidera can cause some side effects. Now, all drugs cause side effects, and one of the Tecfidera side effects was GI upset. So GI upset is a pleasant way of talking about diarrhea or bloating or gas or what have you. And there are some patients, not most, but some patients that when they take Tecfidera, they have some GI upset and it actually leads to them stopping the drug. Now, this is a major issue when you take a pill twice a day, because another factor that we have to consider is taking a pill twice a day is a lot harder than taking a pill once a day. And that's not conjecture. That's actually been very well studied. And it's a clear phenomenon that human beings aren't as good at taking a pill twice a day as once a day. Now, as we started to use Tecfidera in clinical practice, we saw that it, it wasn't working out as well as it did in the clinical trials. In the clinical trials, you have a coordinator calling you saying, please take your medicine. They're checking all your bottles and they're encouraging you to do it. And you don't have that in the real world. And so over the next subsequent few years, Tecfidera um, sort of fell out of favor in our clinic. We started to use it less and less because of the concerns of remembering to take it twice a day and because of the concerns of GI upset. So that was 2013, 14, 15. Now we move all the way to 2019. I have a lot less hair. And there's a newly approved drug by the FDA, diroximal fumarate. Now, remember, Tecfidera is called um, uh, dimethyl fumarate. This is diroximal fumarate. So it's related. It's an ester salt. All right. So it's a fumaric ester salt. Um, but it's been tweaked a little bit. And the tweak of this new medicine is supposed to be that it has less GI upset. Uh, they studied the drug in the Evolve MS1 clinical trial, um, and what they found in the Evolve MS1 clinical trial is that diroximal fumarate, this new drug, Vumeridae, does cause GI upset, but not as much as we saw with Tecfidera. So maybe 30-some percent of people in the clinical trials of diroximal fumarate, this new drug, Vumeridae, noticed GI upset. And it's hopeful that because it's slightly less, I think the manufacturer hopes that people that couldn't tolerate the GI side effects of Tecfidera will consider Vumeridae as an option. Um, and that's their hope. And they have now uh, sought and received FDA approval of a uh, Tecfidera Me Too drug. It's not bringing a new mechanism of action to the market. It's not bringing a new way of treating MS to the market. It's something that's already been done and been out for six plus years but it's supposed to have less GI side effects. Now, let me weigh in about my own opinions, all right? So my opinion is that Tecfidera and Vumeridae are medium efficacy drugs. They're not low efficacy drugs and they're not high efficacy drugs. They're sort of middle of the road. And if someone wants to use a middle of the road efficacy drug, then I think this drug is on the table. Now, many of you that follow my channel know that it's my opinion that I want to put you on the most effective medicine that you're comfortable taking. And if the most effective medicine that you're comfortable taking is a medium range medicine, well, then we're going to consider those medium range medicines. But if the most comfortable medicine that you're, you're comfortable taking is a high efficacy medicine, that's where I want to start our discussion. So I don't imagine that I personally am going to grab for this Tecfidera Me Too drug right off the shelf if we're making a decision based on efficacy. Now, I also have a concern that the medicine remains twice daily dosing because we've learned that asking a human to take a medicine once in the morning and once in the evening is much more challenging than if you take it once a day. And that's just a phenomenon. And so I also need to add that this new drug, diroximal fumarate, Vumeridae, isn't one pill twice a day. It's two pills twice a day. So you have two pills twice a day. That's four pills that you're taking a day. And that may also create another layer of complexity. Nonetheless, it's nice to have options in MS. Yesterday, we had yet another drug enter the market. It's not new. It's not exciting. It's not something that's dramatically different. It's a Me Too drug that is supposed to be better tolerated from a GI standpoint.
So who might this drug be right for? Maybe someone that's comfortable taking a pill twice a day, taking two pills twice a day, who doesn't mind only dealing with medium efficacy as opposed to high efficacy, and wants to see if there's less GI side effects with this fumaric ester as compared to the parent compound Tecfidera. That's my two cents. That's my opinion. It doesn't make me right. It just makes me opinionated. I would love to hear your opinions. What do you think about Vumerity, this new diroximal fumarate, this Tecfidera Me Too drug? Do you think taking two pills twice a day is a no-go? Or do you think taking two pills twice a day is no big deal? Do you think that if there's less GI side effects, people will be more able to tolerate it? Leave your comments down in the description below. So I want to now turn our attention over to the live stream, to the chat. I'm going to read through some questions and answer them live. They don't need to be about diroximal fumarate. They can be about anything related to MS whatsoever. I'm here to answer your questions and this ask me anything for. So Matt Z, one of our wonderful moderators is helping out. He's forwarded a question from Lisa Harris and Lisa asks, I got my flu shot October 26th. Good job getting a flu shot. Just had my next Ocrevus infusion scheduled November 13th. Is my flu shot going to be ineffective? So probably not. And let's review flu shots in MS medicines. So first of all, the flu, influenza A, kills people. The flu is not a slang term for having a little virus or some croup or having a cold. Influenza, the flu, is fatal in, in some people. There's a number of people that die every year from flu-related flu uh, problems. So this is not like no big deal. This is a very, very big deal. And what we uh, do each year is we take the dead strains of the flu from last year, and we smash them up and we make a vaccine of fragments of that old virus, and we inject it into people so that their immune system can build a arsenal, can build an immune response to last year's flu bugs in hopes that some of those strains are the predominant strains this year. And that's how flu vaccines work. And that's why we need to take them each year. And so all people, um, with MS should be considered for the flu vaccine with a couple caveats. Number one, we don't want to give people with MS live vaccine, all right? We don't want to give them a live vaccine. We want to give them a dead vaccine. In the flu shot, the jab, as they say in England, the flu jab is a dead vaccine. So that's good. You don't want the nasal spray up the nose. That's a live vaccine. So we want dead vaccine. That's the first point. The second point is that if you are receiving certain types of immunosuppression or chemotherapy, it might not be appropriate for you to get the flu vaccine. And just like everything on this channel, this channel is all about love. This channel is all about MS education. This channel is about empowering you and educating you and energizing you. It's not about replacing your doctor's opinions or giving advice uh, contrary to what your medical professional said. So you must, you are required to talk to your MS provider about whether a flu shot is safe for you. And if you're on a certain type of chemotherapy, it might not be appropriate this flu season. So the, the question specifically is about Ocrevus and the timing of the vaccine. Now, here's the deal. If you take a flu vaccine and you take Ocrevus, it's not going to cause you to have an attack and it's not going to cause you to develop the flu, but the timing of the flu vaccine and the Ocrevus matters as far as how successful the flu vaccine takes. So in the scenario that you've provided, Lisa, where you took uh, the flu vaccine late October, and then you waited about four weeks before your Ocrevus, that is fantastic. And in fact, that's our best case recommendation is to take the, the dead flu vaccine four to six weeks leading up to your next Ocrevus infusion. Why? It gives your body the best chance to mount an immune response against the flu vaccine. If you took Ocrevus and then a week later or two weeks later or just after the Ocrevus took your flu vaccine, it wouldn't cause you to have an attack and it wouldn't cause you to have the flu, but it might not fully take. The vaccine might not 100% work. It'll still help you mount a response, but it might be an attenuated response. And that's data that we're learning about as we've studied this in people with MS 
on okra taking vaccines. So what do you do if you can't perfectly time your okravis and your flu vaccine? You get the flu vaccine anyways, because in my opinion, it's still going to be helpful. It just might not be 100% helpful. And maybe it's only hypothetically 60 or 80% helpful, but that's still better than nothing. So that was an awesome question, Lisa. Thank you for asking it. And the take home is you have to talk to your MS provider about the best option for you um, and make sure that you do that. That was a great question. What else is cooking here? I've got another question that Matt has uh, queued up. Matt, thank you very much. Uh, let's see here. Oh, I skipped through a bunch of questions. I hate when I do this. All right, Inga F writes, any information on the new injection for spasticity? Sorry, but I don't remember the name of it. It starts with a D. I'm not sure about the injection that you're talking about. Inga, if you can find out the name of it, I could comment on it. So Bluffton question uh, from central New Jersey. Are the locations of lesions associated with specific functions? That's a great question. So you're asking about neuroanatomy and if an MS lesion in a certain area of the brain causes a certain pattern of deficits. And the answer is yes. I actually have several uh, viewers questions saved up about lesion localization, neuroanatomy, functional anatomy. And I'm currently working on a video answering those specific questions. So I'm going to be talking about what does a lesion in the spinal cord do? What does the lesion in the front of the brain do? What does the lesion in the back of the brain do? And that'll be coming out probably in the next month or two. But it's very interesting that the lesions in MS don't behave like the lesions in stroke. And so let me spend just a few minutes talking to you about that. When you have a stroke, you suddenly have a portion of the brain die. And so that portion of the brain stops working. It's like a heart attack of the brain. I'm talking about stroke. And so if that portion of the brain controls language function, then you can't talk or you can't understand language and it's instant. MS doesn't act like that. MS doesn't cause parts of the brain tissue to suddenly die. It causes inflammation, swelling of the tissue, um, inrush of a bunch of cells. It's kind of like a traffic jam on a highway. And so you have a loss of function, but it's typically subacute. It's not instantaneous. It's over hours to days. And when the inflammation quells, sometimes the tissue is still intact and it works fine. Sometimes not so much and you can be left with residual damage. Because of these differences, the way that MS manifests clinically isn't as straightforward as stroke. And in fact, the brain is very plastic. I don't mean plastic like, um, like a chair that's made out of plastic. I mean that it's flexible and that it can adapt and it can rewire. And so oftentimes what we see in the setting of MS is not that someone's lost a function. Maybe they temporarily lost it during an attack and then it came back partway or all the way. But the way the brain is taking care of that problem is it's rewired, is it's set new pathways to accomplish the same goal. And so you still have that function because you've changed how the brain works, which is really, really cool. Now, this has other problems downstream because it taxes the brain. It uses much more energy to get the job done, but you can still get the job done. The point here is that it is not exactly a this lesion always causes this problem. Sometimes uh, it doesn't work out like that, which makes MS neurology very, very confusing. Nonetheless, that is an awesome question and tune in over the next month or so. I'll be putting out a video dedicated to MS lesion localization to help you better understand neuroanatomy and the functional correlates. Super awesome question. There are 99 people online. I'm hopeful that we can get one more person and crest 100. There's only 26 thumbs up. If you like what we're doing right now, please give the live stream a thumbs up. Let me know that you're digging it. You may have to leave the live stream to click the thumbs up button and then jump back into the live stream. But show me some love and give me a couple thumbs up if you're digging what we're doing right now. Let's look at some other questions. So the next question comes from Even So It Is Well. Now, Even So It Is Well has a presence on YouTube. She has a YouTube channel. If you haven't checked that out, I would encourage you to go to her channel and check her channel out. And her question is, my EBV Epstein-Barr virus antibody numbers are up a bit. What are your thoughts on EBV and MS worth treating? So there is a very large literature looking at EBV, the kissing flu, mononucleosis. 
And EBV is something that affects well over 90% of human beings. It's a very, very common uh, virus to come in contact with. It can cause a chronic fatigue syndrome. It can cause mononucleosis. And there's a question as to whether or not it might trigger multiple sclerosis. I said it's a question because we don't have the answer yet. And it's something that's actually very hard to study. So many people get EBV that it makes it difficult to study. Now, in someone who already has an MS diagnosis, that whole discussion is past tense. And we don't have uh, solid answers yet to say, if you have MS, this is what we should do about EBV. Uh, I, I'm not surprised that EBV is present if we test for it. I do not have a specific recommendation about it being a little elevated or what we would do about that. There's a bunch of laboratories and things that we would have to look at carefully, obviously outside the context of me answering your question right now. Thank you for asking it. All right, what else do we have uh, cooking here? Now, uh, L. Hope writes, same question for Lemtrada and low CD4 cells. So th that's a very, very different scenario. Lemtrada, alemtuzumab, is a drug that knocks out adult B and T cells, and then they slowly come back. Uh, and the rate at which they come back is different for different kinds of cells. Very interesting. This morning, there was a paper published. Uh, I saw it on PubMed, and I pushed it out through my Twitter, um, which looked at the way those cells return. And so if you haven't checked out my Twitter, I'm going to give a link down below on you can follow me on Twitter. I just posted that below, and I have an, art, an article that I linked on that exact topic that came out this morning. So that's a very, very appropriate question. All right, let's look for some more questions. So Jillian Martin asks, is MS inflammation linked to inflammation in the gut, stomach, or esophagus? Generally speaking, no. So the inflammation that impacts multiple sclerosis is limited to the supercomputer that runs the body, the holiest of holies, the brain, the optic nerves that run the eyeballs, and the spinal cord, the superhighway that takes the information from the brain down the, to the toes and back up. The inflammation does not extend into the nerves or the muscles or into the non-nervous uh, organs. Now, sometimes nature is a little too generous and you can have two things going on. You can have MS and you can have gut inflammation, but as we understand it, MS doesn't cause inflammation of the esophagus. If you do have one autoimmune disease, you're more likely to have a second autoimmune disease, just statistically speaking. Uh, that was a good question. We now have 107 people online, and that's really, really cool. It is a Thursday at 10 a.m. in the morning, and here we are. This global village has amassed, and I just love the fact that there's over 100 folks that have joined me online today. We only have 69 thumbs up, and so if you like what we're doing, give it a thumbs up and let me know that you're digging this live stream. Let's answer some more questions. So Tiffany Carr asks, are skin infections common with MS DMTs? So that's a great question. So for starters, MS generally doesn't impact the skin directly. So if you have MS, multiple sclerosis doesn't cause a rash. That's the first thing. The second thing is many of the MS medicines, the disease modifying therapies, can have an impact on skin. And so just a little bit ago, we were talking about dimethylfumarate, Tecfidera, and diroximal fumarate, which is vumerity. And these medicines can cause facial flushing and they can cause a rash. There are other MS medicines that can cause a rash. And there are other MS medicines that increase the risk of skin cancer by less than a percent. So by a very small amount. It, it stands to reason, however, that we want a doctor to investigate our skin. We want a doctor, in my opinion, once a year to look over all your skin and make sure that all the moles look okay. I like to joke that uh, it's not my goal to get my patients naked. I like my patients to wear clothes when I see them. And so I send my patients once a year to what I refer to as a naked doctor, uh, to a doctor who's an expert at looking at naked skin, and they can look you up and down and make sure all the moles and everything look okay. And then they can write me a letter and say, Dear Dr. B., uh, I looked at their skin. Their skin looks fine. Love, Nakey Doctor. And that's a way of keeping you safe. Not because you're on an MS therapeutic that could impact skin, but because you're a human being with skin and we don't want to miss something. Um, and I think that's just a best practice. So let's see what else we have cooking here. 
So um, DM CD or DMC McDonald net video uh, writes the following question. Can you have a live vaccine before you start a DMT? As a general rule, we recommend avoiding live vaccines. Um, there's a long history and story behind that, but as a general rule, we don't recommend a live vaccine, particularly if a dead vaccine is available. So it wouldn't be our, our first choice to tell someone impacted by MS to have a live vaccine. We would want a dead vaccine. All right. So let's see what other questions we have cooking here. So DMAC writes, what can I realistically expect after completing my second year of Lemtrada? So many of you know that Lemtrada, uh, alemtuzumab, is a discontinuous therapy. It's an infusion in the vein that you take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, five days in a row. We call that the first round. Then we wait, year, we wait 12 months, and then we take Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. Then we take the second round, which is three days. So DMAC has done the first round waited a year, the, the second round, and now they're asking what to expect. So one thing to expect is that you're going to have laboratories done every month, blood and urine, for four more years minimum. That is an expectation when taking this drug. Another thing to expect is that you're going to be monitored, both clinically, to make sure that you're not having clinical breakthrough disease, God forbid, an attack or loss of function, and you're going to be monitored with an MRI to look for new spots on your brain. You can expect realistically that if you have, God forbid, a new attack, or if you have new MRI spots, then there will be a discussion about whether or not you need a third course of Lemtrada. So you got your five days up front, you wait a year, your three days, and then during this monitoring period, if you have two new spots on MRI and or a new attack, then there would be a discussion about treating again. Um, those are the expectations of what you can expect while you're on Lemtrada. Now, the hope is that it's boring. The hope is that the induction of five days plus three days leads to a quiet, boring trajectory for many years to come. And we now have data that goes out eight years. So people that started uh, Lemtrada and eight years later were still following them. Half of those people have never been retreated because they've gone eight years and they didn't have an attack and they didn't have new spots on MRI, which is kind of awesome sauce. 30% of people required a third round. So they had to have another three days at some point. And that doesn't mean that they did bad at eight years. That just means that they had breakthrough disease. About 13% required a fourth round. And so those are some of the expectations. Uh, I have an entire playlist on this channel dedicated to Lemtrada. Uh, and if you'd like to have some more questions answered as it relates to Lemtrada, please check out that playlist. I appreciate the question. All right. So let's see what else we have here. Um, Darla forwards a question from Jantastic. Will not taking steroids during a flare-up cause more permanent damage uh, than just waiting it out? So Jantastic asks, if taking steroids will cause more permanent damage? And the answer is no. Steroids will not cause more damage. Steroids will quell damage and quell inflammation. So if you have an MS attack, it's because of inflammation in the brain, optic nerves, or spinal cord. And that inflammation can eat away at the tissue. It can cause brain damage or spinal cord damage. Giving steroids quells the inflammation, quiets down the inflammation, and in my strong opinion, it can make a better outcome long term. So no, taking steroids doesn't make things worse. Taking steroids speeds up the recovery. Thank you for the question. I hope that that helps. So Kizzy Girl, that's kind of a cool name. Kizzy Girl writes, can a live vaccine cause cellulitis in MS as a reaction? So Kizzy Girl asks about vaccines. And this question actually doesn't have anything to do with MS. It doesn't matter if you have MS or not. Um, a cellulitis is caused because where you got the skin injection, there was, there was an infection that set up there. I don't think that a live virus or a dead virus matters very much as it relates to risk of cellulitis. I personally view the risk of cellulitis 
to be more related to the technique of injection. So if you have uh, bacteria and, and junk and dirt on your skin and it's not cleaned off properly, and then you jab a needle in, you could introduce that bacteria into the skin and into the subcutaneous tissue and you could have an infection. If, for example, you have a flu shot and you scratch it and you rip open the skin, you could introduce bacteria and you could have an infection. And that infection could cause a cellulitis. But that's not related, in my opinion, to the live versus dead vaccine discussion. And it's not related to having MS. It's all about the injection technique. Now, of course, again, I'll say that if you are on an immunosuppressant, and you have MS, you need to talk to your doctor before getting a vaccine because there could be increased risks um, and things like cellulitis would need to be discussed. But the big thing is to use a proper sterile technique. You wanna clean off the skin with alcohol. You wanna make sure that the nurse doing the injection does it properly. You wanna keep it covered up and you don't wanna scratch and lick it and try to get it infected. That would be crazy. All right, what else do we have cooking here? So Clovix says, Dr. Boster, do you have any conflicts of interest to disclose with pharmaceutical companies? Yes, I do, Clovix. And if you go to my channel, the about section, I have listed all my disclosures, uh, all my financial relationships with anyone that I've worked with. And I keep that updated so that I can be transparent on this channel. Thank you for bringing that up. And I would encourage you to check out the about section if you'd like to know what those disclosures are. So Alex R. writes in, drugs that accelerate remyelination, how many more are waiting for them? Um, research um, clemestine fumarate, it's interesting. So, so Alex R. touches base on something which is uh, really the very, very exciting. And it's the fact that in order to beat this disease MS, we probably need three kinds of drugs. We need an anti-inflammatory, uh, in all of the currently FDA-approved MS medicines are various types of anti-inflammatory medicines. Uh, and so those are medicines that quell inflammation. And we need those. But we also probably need a different kind of medication, a medication called a remyelinating agent. And the goal of a remyelinating agent is that you could put the myelin back on the axon of the nerve. You could basically put the plastic coating back on the electric wire. And because MS can cause demyelination, it can strip the, the wire naked. We want to put the myelin back on. That's called remyelination. And presently, we do not have a, a remyelinating agent that is FDA approved. So that's not currently available, but it's being actively studied, which is super awesome. Um, Alex R. talks about one of the potential remyelinating agents that's being studied. There are many that are being studied. Uh, for those of you that participated in my live stream right after the Ectrams conference I did last month, I talked about some of these exciting advancements in remyelinating research. And it's my opinion that within 10 years, we're going to see a remyelinating agent FDA approved and available for MS. Now, there's three therapies that I think we need, an anti-inflammatory, a remyelinating agent, and then we also need a neuroprotective agent, something to protect the nervous system from getting beat up. And we don't have that yet either. So remyelinating agents are very exciting. I think it's a real thing. It's not prime time yet. We don't have an FDA approved remyelinating agent, but we have some that are actively being studied and very, very exciting. Um, sorry, I'm just checking out some things um, on my phone here. All right, what else do we have cooking? So John Wayne writes, can MS still do damage when in remission? And uh, that's a very, very important question. So when uh, MS terminology was uh, coined in, say, the 60s, they used the term relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis, relapsing, remitting multiple sclerosis. And they borrowed the term relapsing, remitting from cancer. So God forbid you have cancer, um, and then they give you chemo and radiation and surgery, and you go into remission. So remission means there's no evidence of cancer in the absence of treatment. And then if the cancer returns, they call that a relapse of the cancer. And this term was inappropriately borrowed to apply to MS. And they would say that when someone was having a new clinical attack, that was a relapse. 
And then there was periods of quiet or remission, which is BS. Uh, the reality is, is that uh, MS doesn't go into remission. Your immune system is still taking pot shots at your brain and spinal cord. And, and so I dislike the term relapsing remitting MS because it gives us a false sense of if you're not having an attack, then you're in remission, which is not true. And so I like the terminology relapsing MS. Um, you'll hear me most often refer to the most common form of MS as relapsing MS. And I remove the word remission because it gives a false sense. So when John Wayne says, can MS still do damage when in remission? The answer is yes. Most of the damage done is not during, uh, is not overt. So it's not just about attacks. And it's a misconception to think if I'm not having an attack, then I'm okay. The reason, for example, that we get an MRI once a year is because we can see brain damage that's occurred that didn't manifest clinically. You had no clinical symptoms. You had no relapse. And yet there are new spots on your MRI. Those new spots are areas where there's been inflammation and oftentimes brain damage. And that occurs in the absence of an attack or, or a relapse. And so that's a very, very important uh, term. Now, I want to spend a moment talking about remission. I looked remission up in the dictionary. And the oncologic or cancer definition of remission is as follows. Five years of no disease activity in the absence of treatment. It doesn't mean a cure. It means that there's no discernible disease activity in the absence of treatment. And there are a couple MS therapies which attempt to offer a chance at remission because they're medicines that are induction therapies. You take them up front and the goal is to set the trajectory to change the course of MS so that you don't have disease activity. And there are other drugs that you take on a continual basis. Most MS medicines you take on a continual basis. Now, they're not going to cause remission, but they can make your disease quiet, which is a lofty goal. So if you're taking a, uh, a therapy um, twice a year or twice a day, you're on a continuous therapy. And if you achieve the goal of boring, where there's nothing going on with your MS, that's awesome. Um, but it's, it's, the word remission is a very charged word, and we have to be very careful. Language matters. And thank you for asking that question. All right. Let's see what else we have cooking here. So Gift Boutique uh, is online. Oh, I just skipped past her. Darn it, Gift Boutique. I didn't mean to do that. You guys know that I sometimes struggle uh, using these live streams correctly. I'm looking for a question here. There's Gift Boutique's question. In my experience with ER visits, they're not knowledgeable about MS. What advice do you have for patients uh, who have to educate the staff? Uh, they usually get annoyed, but I know the facts. And so it's true that the emergency department is a triage center. They have a very, very hard job in the emergency department. They take all comers without a schedule and they have to very quickly figure out, oh my God, are you at risk of death? Or, oh my God, are you really, really sick? Or, hey, are you doing okay? And they have to very quickly figure out what to do with someone. And they're either going to treat you and send you back home, or treat you and admit you into the intensive care unit or into the hospital or treat you and then get you to set up an appointment with your primary care doctor. That's actually very hard work. And people with MS sometimes create a problem, uh, not on purpose, but for the emergency department, because they're not as familiar with multiple sclerosis as they are with, say, a heart attack or stroke. And that doesn't mean that the emergency department doesn't care. They do. And it doesn't mean they're not smart, because they are. They're very smart. But they're, they're, they may not be up and up on the latest and greatest of the MS therapies, for example, because that's not something that they see on a regular basis. And it's not uncommon that people with MS can have a frustrating experience, not because the ER is doing a bad job, but just because of the nature of what's done in the emergency department. And so how do you grapple with that? Well, one way is that you could take a copy of your last clinic note and give it to the ER staff so they can read the doctor's note about where things are with your MS the last time you were in, what medicines that you're taking, what the side effects of those medicines are. And so when I see patients in clinic, I send them home with a note, the same note that I send their doctor, I give to them. And it's got all the info about their MS and about the medicines that they're on. And specifically, I like to include a whole section about the good, the bad, and the ugly, the side effects uh, of the medicines that they're taking. And so that way, when you go to the ER, you can just hand it to them and say, here, 
here's information um, about my MS from my MS provider. That's one option. A second thing that you could do is you could ask them to call the MS doctor. So almost all the people that I take care of have my cell phone number and it's for emergencies and going to the ER counts. It's the emergency room. And so one of the things you could do is you could say, hey, uh, I have MS, I'm on this drug. Um, it's a bit unusual maybe. And so here's uh, my doctor's phone number. Go ahead and give her or him a call and you can talk to them on the phone and they can help bring you up to speed. Um, so those are two tips that I have. Bringing a medication list to the emergency department is a really good idea. Bringing a list of your medical ailments, if you have a list of, of what we call your past medical history, if it's all written down for them so you can hand it to them, that can be very, very helpful. Giving them the phone numbers to your primary care doctor, to your neurologist, to your pharmacy, these are also things that can help. Um, nonetheless, I appreciate Gift Boutique the frustration when you go to the ER and they don't get it. And please understand, it's not because they don't care. Um, I think that the ER is a wonderful place. They have a really, really hard job and the goal is for proper communication. So hopefully some of these techniques help you guys. So Mike Rush says, can I take Vumerity if I'm already taking Ocrevus? And, and so as we talked about at the beginning of this live stream, uh, Vumerity is the newly FDA approved Tecfidera Me2 drug. It's two pills twice a day, um, diroximal fumarate. And I would not want to give you both MS medicines at the same time. Um, they work in different ways and mechanistically that might be okay, but it might increase the risk of various side effects like risk for infection. And we simply uh, haven't studied that. It would not be my recommendation that I do both drugs. I would do one drug or I would do the other drug, but I would probably not put both online at the same time unless we were able to study that in the clinical trial. All right, so, so Kevin Waters writes, seven months post final Ocrevist infusion, and my immune system is still highly suppressed. How long can it take to return to normal levels? So the, uh, the way that Ocrevus works is it doesn't suppress your entire immune system. It suppresses a sliver of your immune system. And let's break this down for you. The immune system comes in two parts. You have the adaptive immune system and the innate immune system. And Ocrevus doesn't do anything to the innate immune system, not at all. Now in the adaptive immune system, there are two parts. You have the T cells and the B cells. And Ocrevus doesn't really do anything to the T cells. Ocrevus affects only the B cells. And amongst the B cells, it doesn't affect all of the B cells. It only affects a section of the B cells. It only affects the adult B cells. So Ocrevus is an immunosuppressant, but it's a selective immunosuppressant. It's like a smart bomb. So instead of thinking about like napalm, which you just burn down the whole place, it's very, very selective in, in what it targets, just adult B cells. And typically it's given every six months because it takes about six months for those B cells to come back. Now, I do not want you to repopulate your B cells. So I do not want you to have normal B cells in preparation for your next ocarus because I'm trying to suppress the B cells. I wanna keep them suppressed and that's the way that we're controlling your MS. So if I have someone who's on Ocrevus and six months later, it's time for their Ocrevus and their CD19 uh, count, which is the number that we follow is zero. That's a good thing. That's what I want it to be. I don't want it to be elevated because if it is, that means that the horse is already out of the barn. Now, the question is what happens when we chronically suppress the B cells over time? And what we have found is in most patients, it doesn't matter. In a small minority of patients, there's an increased risk of infection. And so in the setting of Ocrevus, if we find that someone's having very frequent infections, well, then we might need to take them off the medicine. But again, the way that we want Ocrevus to work or any of the B-cell depleters to work, Ocrevus, um, Ocrevizumab, Ufutumumab, Rituximab, um, Oblituximab, these medicines are intended to suppress the B-cells and keep them suppressed. We don't want them to come back up. Very good question. All right, so Ali Uncharted writes, that's kind of a cool name. Hello, Ali Uncharted. 
So Ali Uncharted writes, should I be treated for a flare relapse before um, I'm put on a DMT? So I really view those things as happening in parallel, all right? And if you are having an attack, I typically want to treat your attack. So I want to give you steroids or something else to quell the inflammation. Separate from that, I want to put you on an MS medicine, a disease-modifying therapy to prevent future attacks. So those are two separate things that have separate goals. If you're having an attack and I put you on a disease-modifying therapy, it doesn't treat that attack. The disease-modifying therapy is like a birth control pill against future attacks that you might have down the line. And so really, I, I think that you want to do both. And if you're having an attack, we want to address it. Let me give you an example. I meet someone in clinic. It's a new consultative visit for me. And during the course of the discussion, we identify that, yes, it's MS. We identify that they're actually having an attack currently. And we identify they need to go on a disease-modifying therapy. In that scenario, we're probably going to treat their attack now, and we're going to start them on an MS disease modifying therapy once the attack is finished. And I'm just sharing that with you to give you an example that we want to do both things um, and that they can both happen simultaneously. So Samantha Collins writes, what does PD stand for? Um, it depends on the context. Uh, oftentimes, I think a PD is standing for Parkinson's disease. Um, in the world of pharmacology, it can stand for pharmacodynamics, um, but I would need the context in order to answer your question. All right, looking for more questions. Um, oh, it's jumping around a little bit, uh, and I just wonder whether I got lost in the questions here. All right, guys, I'm trying to scroll back to make sure that I didn't miss any crazy questions. Again, if I did miss a question, you know that I'll address them soon um, in a follow-up live stream. All right. Um, so here's a question from a wonderful person, Laura Kay. Laura, how are you? I hope that you and your family are doing well. And Laura writes, what tips can you give to keep mentally active we hear a lot about physical activity. I think that's a great question. So, Laura, I have an entire uh, playlist on this channel uh, called Cognition, where I talk about MS thinking and memory. Uh, and I have uh, many videos, probably over 20, where I give tips and tricks and suggestions for how to up your thinking and memory game. On the live stream right now, let's just talk about a couple tips. Uh, maybe we'll come up with five of things that you can do to stay intellectually active. Number one, read books. So reading is not the same thing as watching the boob tube, the passive TV, where you kind of may pay attention to what's going on. Reading is a much different process, which is very, very active. Um, and one of the things that you can do to up your game is to read books. If you want to take that to the next level, read a book and then talk about it. So read the same book that your spouse is reading and then have a discussion at dinner about it read a book and then get together in a book club and discuss it or a Bible study and then discuss it. But reading and then engaging in a conversation about reading is a great pro tip to keep you cognitively intact. Another option is working, volunteering, or going to school. Working, volunteering, or going to school are ways of being active and involving your mind. And so if you uh, are, are in a job and you have to multitask and keep a lot of things straight, that's forcing you to be cognitively active. Same thing with volunteering, obviously same thing with taking college classes. So a second pro tip is to engage in working, volunteering, or taking classes. And you can do that online, you can audit classes, there's a million different ways to do it. Another way is to do um, uh, mental puzzles and games. And so if you are a, uh, a word person and you love yourself some crosswords, do it up, get some crosswords puzzles. Um, you can download apps on your phone, for example, uh, Words with Friends. Uh, there's a multitude of word-based uh, cognitive games that you can play. If you're more of a numbers person and you tend to gravitate towards numbers, consider getting a, a book in the supermarket on Sudoku. I love Sudoku puzzles. There's a myriad of puzzles like that. There's also apps that you can get on your phone, things like Luminosity and, a, and a, a, a plethora of other apps that you can download that are cognitively um, challenging puzzles. And so you can do those puzzles. A pro tip would be go to your supermarket, 
And in the checkout line, pick up a couple crossword puzzles, word find puzzles, some math puzzles, some Sudoku, and then put them in your bathrooms. So when you're at home uh, on the throne and you've got a couple extra minutes, we'll do a Sudoku puzzle and it's going to make you cognitively stimulated. So those are some things that you can do. Um, I think that it's important that people impacted by MS stay physically active, socially active, and intellectually active. Those are all very, very important. Um, and if you'd like some more pro tips on how you can up your COG game, check out the playlist that I made mention. In fact, Laura, let's see if I can be savvy and I can actually link the playlist right here. I'm going to try to do that while I'm on the live stream. That's always kind of a dicey thing for me to try to pull off. But let's just see if I can do it. Um, I'm trying to pull it up right now. And if I'm successful, yeah, I am. I've got 20 videos in this live stream. Uh, excuse me, 20 videos in this playlist. And I'm going to post it right here. So, Laura, I'm posting the playlist. If you click that playlist, there's 20 videos I've made on cognition. Many of them include tips and tricks to up your cog game. So Amanda Siebert writes, what traveling precautions would you recommend when traveling to, say, Jamaica while in Okermis? Should we be concerned? So I've got a, a video on traveling with MS, uh, going on vacation with MS, and so you can check out that video uh, if you haven't seen it already. Uh, that's one that kind of goes over a lot of different uh, important things to consider when traveling. Uh, I think that one of the things that you have to think about when you're going anywhere in the world is are you required to get certain immunizations or vaccinations? The answer in Jamaica is you don't. Uh, and is there, um, is there any other infectious concerns? Uh, I would definitely let my MS provider know, hey, I'm going to go to Jamaica. Um, but generally speaking, I don't think that there's a lot of things that you would have to be particularly concerned about when you're traveling. Now, um, let me see just in the spirit of sharing whether I can um, link that vacation video that I made mention. Um, so that you guys can have access to that. Again, it's a little bit tricky for me to do this while I'm on the live stream, but what the hey, hey, let's just try to pull it off. I'm going to try to pull forward that vacation video. Yep, so here we go. And I'm going to place a link to this vacation video. Um, I think I made the vacation video when I was actually in Spain. And so if you look at the background of where I'm filming, it was in a cafe in Spain. It was actually really beautiful. All right, let's look at some other questions. That was a really, really good one. So Sasha writes, hey, Dr. Booster. Well, hello, Sasha. How are you? A uh, question. Um, now I've been tested uh, for anti-MOG antibodies. What are they for? So Multiple sclerosis is an autoimmune condition that affects the brain, optic nerves, and spinal cord. There's a cousin of multiple sclerosis called NMO, or neuromyelitis optica. And NMO is also an autoimmune process. It's also demyelinating, but it affects just the optic nerves and spinal cord mostly. It does the brain a lot less. And a lot of people that have NMO have antibodies against NMO. So when you test their blood, you can find anti-NMO antibodies. It turns out that there's a third cousin. So you've got MS, you've got NMO, and now you have this other condition called anti-MOG syndrome, M-O-G. Um, and so anti-MOG syndrome is very similar to NMO, but it's caused by a different autoimmune process, a different autoantibody. And fortunately, we can now test the blood for anti-MOG antibodies. So when you're working some up someone up for multiple sclerosis, particularly if they have optic nerve or spinal cord involvement, it's very appropriate to check a couple extra laboratories to make sure that in fact that person doesn't have a cousin of MS. Um, Anti-MOG um, antibodies would tell you, hey, I'm more concerned that they actually have a cousin of multiple sclerosis, anti-MOG syndrome, as opposed to MS. And that's what those antibodies are about. I think it's very appropriate to check anti-MOG antibodies when working someone up for MS. All right, let's see what other questions are there. So Chuck O uh, joins us. Chuck O is an awesome viewer, a longtime viewer. He's a moderator. Um, I really appreciate all of Chuck's help. Hello, Chuck. Uh, along with Matt and Darla, you guys are really helping out on the live stream today. And I thank you for that. 
Chuck apologized. He's late showing up. Um, and he had to do uh, his, getting ready for work in his infusion. Well, Chuck, we're glad to have you here. Thanks a lot, my friend. All right, looking for other questions. So Ali Uncharted asks another question. She says, what medicines do you switch to if a Tysabri patient is JC virus antibody positive and worried about PML? That's a great question. So this brings up several very important points. The first point is that the risk benefit of a drug needs to be constantly reevaluated. And a medicine which has a benefit um, and a risk needs to be thought about in that particular moment in time for that particular patient. Something which is adequately safe today might not be adequately safe tomorrow. It could change. Or something where the benefit outweighs the risk today might no longer have that same benefit risk ratio down the line. And this is an example. So if you are taking Tysabri and you are antibody negative for the JC virus, then we believe that your risk of getting the PML infection is only theoretical. And if you contract to tell you that you're okay with it, and it's not my privilege to tell you that you're not okay with it, what I have to do is educate you and show you the numbers and help you understand the risk profile. And only then can you say, whoa, 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 I'm not comfortable doing that, or I don't mind. And so those numbers can change over time. And if you are taking Tysabri, let's say, which is a really, really good drug, and your JC virus antibody positive, if you are um, someone who thinks through the numbers and says, I'm okay with that risk, well, then you're going to keep on keeping on. And if you're someone that thinks through the numbers and says, I'm not okay with that risk, then you may need to consider making a switch. And that's the question that we have right here. So what do you do? There's a couple things that you could do. One thing is that you could go from every four weeks to every six weeks. You could spread out the doses. And it looks like that might lower the individual's risk of developing PML. So that's an option if you wanted to stay on Tysabri, but you wanted to lower the risk profile of PML. Another option is you could switch to a different disease-modifying therapy. And whenever we switch therapy for any reason, I like to hit pause. So this is the pause button. And then I like to open up the books and I like to review everything that's available. I like to make a list of what you've been on in the past. I like to make a list of the things that you don't think you're going to tolerate or accept from a safety standpoint. And then I make a, a list of the things that we might consider, everything that we might consider. And then we're going to talk through that list. And again, in the moment for you, pick the right drug for that time for that person. Um, I can't tell you that, oh, if someone's uh, antibody positive with Tysabri, then we always switch to X or we always switch to Y. Because it really depends on that individual and what they've been on in the past, how active their MS is, uh, what they've tolerated, what they haven't tolerated, what their own goals are, and what their risk aversion is. I'll share with you that in my own practice, a lot of times if we're on Tysabri and we're JC virus positive and no longer comfortable, we're probably going to switch to another monoclonal antibody. We're going to be thinking about Ocrevus or Lentrata. And that doesn't make me right. It just makes me opinionated. Why do I have that opinion? Because Tysabri is a highly effective medicine, and I want to stay on the same shelf of highly effective medicines. I don't want to drop down to something that in groups is less efficacious. So I hope that helps. I'm looking for some other things. Some other questions here. So Mark uh, Carfang writes in 10 months post round three of Lemtrada and still progressing and relapsing. Can I go to Ocrevus or Tysabri or do I need to wait longer? So obviously, Mark, uh, I can't answer specifically for you because I don't have all of your details right in front of me. Um, I will say that this can't happen. Uh, and that about 13% of people that were treated with um, three rounds end up um, getting a fourth round. And so it's really something that we would have to look at carefully for you. We'd have to look at the frequency of your relapses coming into the third round. We have to look at the aggressive behavior of disease currently. We have to look at what's available and what those risks are. And really the decision tree as you lay out is A, give it more time on Lemtrada. B, switch to another agent, and you list Okra or Tysabri. And I think all of those are a, a very appropriate discussion, but it's a very, very specific discussion for you 
for your specific situation to be determined with your MS provider. That's a conversation that I have with a lot of families in the clinic room, um, and it's a conversation that's very, very important. Uh, and I definitely hope that you can have that conversation with your MS provider in the very, very near future. All righty, I'm going to take one more question, uh, and then I'm going to wrap up. So let's see here. So Andrea writes in, hi, Dr. B. Well, hello, Andrea. Um, started my first DMT two years ago. I'm okay now, but I had to stop Tecfidera two months ago uh, due to a low lymphocyte count. Um, now still low uh, to start a new disease modifying therapy. Would it be risky to uh, start Tecfidera again? And so this is a side effect of Tecfidera. Um, upwards of maybe 20% of people drop their white blood cell count, their lymphocyte count. Uh, and there's a host of potential concerns that occur when that happens. Uh, there's a waiting game of letting it come back up. And again, I can't answer specifically for you, Andrea. There's too many variables that we would have to consider. How active is your disease radiographically on MRI? How active is your disease clinically? What's going on in your neuro exam? What do your lab numbers look like? What have you been on in the past? How comfortable are, are we waiting, et cetera? I'm going to wrap up now. My name is Aaron Boster, and I want to thank you for learning about MS with me. I want to thank you for your active participation on this channel. I love this global online village. I love watching it grow, and I love the love and support that we have. I want to give a shout out to Chuck O, to Darla, and to Matt Z, awesome moderators today for helping keep things moving. And I want to thank all 115 people that spent an hour with me live as we answered questions about MS, talking about new MS therapies, and answering your questions. I try to do a, a live stream a couple times a month. I'm putting out a video twice a week, typically on Mondays and Thursdays. I love your comments and questions, so keep them coming. If I didn't get to your question, please don't fret. I'm going to read through them in the post, and I'll save them for future videos and live streams. Until my next video or live stream, this is Aaron Boster saying thank you for learning about MS with me, and take care.